my dear friends masters and gods of the universe welcome to digital dhyana swadhyaya yogam presented to you by pyramid spiritual society's moment global and digital swadhyaya yoga team india the purpose of these sessions as you all know is knowledge enhancement i am saroja gullapalli from melbourne australia your host for this show today dear friends today is day 16 of the 21 days program in english language and we have dena mariam madam amongst us from new york as our special guest for this program today before i call upon her i would like to say a few words about her dena mariam madam is the founder and convener of the global peace initiative of women which is called gpiw bringing spiritual resources to address critical global challenges such as conflicts social justice and ecological scarring of the earth over the years she has worked to bring greater gender balance and balance between the abrahamic and dharma based religious traditions for a more inclusive interfaith movement she served as vice chair of the millennium world peace summit of religious and spiritual leaders held at the united nations in new york in the year 2000 she subsequently convened a meeting of women religious and spiritual leaders in geneva and from that gathering founded the global peace initiative of women in 2002 for over 40 years dena maria madam has been a devotee of paramhamsa yogananda a practitioner of kriya yoga meditation and a student of the great texts of the vedic traditions she received her masters degree from columbia university in sacred literature she has served on the boards of the harvard center for the study of world religions all india movement for seva which is called aim for seva the gross national happiness center in bhutan in 2014 she received the nirvana peace prize for her interfaith peace efforts most of all she is very dear and well known to all of us viewers of this platform through her great book the untold story of sita i had the great opportunity to share the wisdom of this book for 16 weeks in three languages with my beloved viewers on this pmc channels madam this book has raised my vibrations as well as the vibrations of millions across the globe and has changed lives of many this has brought back the connection with the nature that we all once had madam i am so fortunate to be that ambassador to bring forth the messages from your book dear friends let me have this pleasure of inviting dena mariam madam to take over this show today she is going to talk to us about sita mata's consciousness dena madam stage is all yours thank you namaste thank you so much for that for that um, wonderful introduction and thank you for inviting me to be here um it's always a great honor for me to speak about um uh, mata sita uh, first of all good evening to everyone and uh, good afternoon to those for whom it's afternoon for me it's it's morning um so i'm i'm very happy to be here with you and to spend these 2 hours together uh, the last 30 minutes we'll have question and answers um so for the next 90 minutes i'd like to focus part of this on the whole saga of ravana ram sita and ravana which unfolds over thousands of years um and so to put this into context i want to read a little bit from um uh the untold story of sita the story about the curse the beginning of the curse and then i want to tell the rest of the story Uh, and read from my book um Rukmini and the Turning of Time which is a book that I'm working on now which completes the story that is the completion of of the story of what happens to this devotee uh named Jaya so uh I want to talk about uh one of the questions that has long been in my mind is does the avatar know that he or she is the avatar what is the consciousness of the avatar when an avatar uh when this great cosmic force that we know as narayan or narayani takes human form they assume certain limitations 
in the because the limitations are part of that phys physical world. They have bodies, physical bodies, and they have to operate within the physical laws. And yet a part of that knowledge is still there. A part of that awareness of who they are is, is still there. Um, and of course, we can't know exactly what their consciousness is. Only an avatar would know that. Um, but so, so this part of the story I want to read is, is a memory that comes back to Sita of her time in Vakuntha with Narayan. Now, what is Vakuntha? We know there's this vast physical universe, and then there's the astral world, the subtle mental world, which is even larger, I'm told, than the physical universe. And then the causal world, the first, the, the, the closest to the unmanifest, to that cosmic sea. Narayan and Narayani are always shown resting in a sea, a sea of consciousness, undifferentiated spirit. And then once manifestation begins, that's the, 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 the causal world, which causes everything else. And so Vakunta, more than a place, is a state of being, an enlightened state of being. And you only can, can arrive there once you've freed yourself of the human traits of egotism and greed, and, and you've reached that enlightened state. But every now and then, through the grace of Narayan and Narayani, a devotee comes in who's not reached that pure state of being. And the hope is that being in that pure state of being would help them rid themselves of those last remains of ego consciousness. So such is the devotee, Jaya and Vijaya, but I just focus on Jaya because he's the main one, who've, who've been given the grace to, be part, to enter that enlightened state, um, even though they haven't achieved perfection yet. So what happens? So the part of the story that I'm gonna read Sita is already in Lanka, and she and Ravana are in this mental battle where he's got tremendous powers. He's entering her mind, creating all kinds of illusions, and she's taking on all the suffering of his victims, of the, the, the people that he's abused, and she's feeling the enormous suffering of the world and, and is about to dissolve herself into the absolute when Ram pulls her back. And then she has the memory again of the cause of this whole thing, the curse. So I'm gonna read a little bit from that. And so just imagine yourself being carried back to Vakunta where this takes place in this high celestial realm. And this is Soma, Sita's attendant, telling the story. She's saying, uh, Sita, we, 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 she, the memory of an event that took place ages ago when she was in the form of Narayani comes back to her. She's walking by the side of the celestial form of Sri Ram, Narayan. Waves of bliss flowed unhindered between them as they walked in silence in Vakunta, their heavenly abode, exchanging thoughts about the beauty of the flowers. Each morning showed a new variety and today's assortment was of striking colors. As they were walking, Narayan said to her, the four Kumaras, the mind manifested sons of Lord Brahma, came today. Why have they not come to see us? She asked. They did, but they were turned away by Jaya, an attendant. Turned away, she was surprised. Narayan continued. The Kumaras came in the form of children and Jaya didn't want to disturb us, or so he said. But in truth, he was envious of their love for us and did not want them to meet us. I will speak with him in time. Looking out into the distance, Narayan spotted the Kamara sages. Nodding in their direction with the beaming face, he said, let us go to them. They have much to share with us. What a joy to meet them again, she replied. They walked toward the four stages filled with happiness. One of the sages looked down and began to say, forgive us, Narayan, for not coming to meet you. Narayan and Narayani simply smiled, and the sages understood that they were aware of what had taken place. I'm sorry for the misbehavior of our attendant, Narayani said. It is nothing, he replied. We are with you now, Prabhu and Mata, and so we rejoice. We have come to share news of the unfolding events on earth. After the Kumaras took their leave, Narayan and Narayani went to find Jaya the devoted attendant. He saw them coming and tried to hide, 
but there is no hiding from Narayan. He saw the seeds of pride and jealousy taking root, seeds that had, long, had been there long ago when Narayan had allowed Jaya to live in that high celestial realm in the hopes that in time, these seeds would dissolve. But Narayan saw that, that seeds which had rested dormant for so long were now beginning to grow and he was concerned for his servant. You turned the Kumaras away who had come to see us after a long absence. In this abode, Jaya, no one is turned away, let alone such great sages. Prabhu, what I did was not wrong. They were rude children and spoke to me in such a disrespectful manner. I did not think you would want to see them in that state of mind. And so I told them to go and calm themselves. No, I am sore that he was speaking untruth and realized the seeds of deception were also taking root in his mind. Jaya, what you are saying is not true. You should know that you cannot deceive me. You must retreat into meditation at once. Root out these seeds of dishonesty and pride that are taking hold of you. You will not be able to remain here long unless you free yourself from these illusions. He gave instructions on where Jaya should go and the type of meditation in which he should engage. Narayani looked on as this scene unfolded. Instead of retreating, as Narayan had advised him, <clears throat> Jaya went to the Kumaras and upbraided them. Why did you go to the Lord and trouble him with your complaints? Jaya asked in an angry tone. The sages looked at him in amazement. They knew what had just taken place, that the Lord had advised him to retreat into meditation. Ignoring his remark, one of the sages offered to guide him in meditation practices, but this only made Jaya angrier. The sages looked at one another, realizing what lay ahead. There was no possibility of anger or pride in this realm. All negative emotions cease to exist when one enters the high celestial or causal planes. And if even the shadow of a negative emotion arises, one would need to, of necessity to withdraw so as not to was, was disturb the high vibrations emanating from there that sustain the denser worlds. If these subtle vibrations were to be disrupted, negative ripples would echo throughout the universe. Narayan appeared and calmly spoke to Jaya. I have already advised you what to do, Jaya, and will now advise you for a second time. Withdraw yourself immediately into meditation and remain there until every negative impulse is dissolved. I will come for you at that time. Jaya apologized to Narayan and took his leave saying to himself, it was not necessary for the Lord to chastise me in front of the others. He has humiliated me. The seed of self-pity took root. I will find a way to make those sages pay for the disruption they have caused in my relationship with my Lord. He did not withdraw himself into meditation as Narayan had advised, but instead began to scheme. As he was sitting alone, he, was, he saw a celestial woman carrying a basket of fruits. Thinking they were for the sages, he approached her. She was beautiful and gracious. Let me carry these fruits to the sages for you, he said. But Jaya had no intention of bringing the fruit to, fruits to the one who was the cause of his humiliation. She saw this and hesitated. In that moment, lust arose in him. She shrank back, shocked by the intensity of his desire, a rarity indeed in this realm. Devi Narayani manifested in front of him and in a stern voice called out, there is no place for lust here, Jaya. You are seeding negative thoughts everywhere and created, creating a tormented course for yourself. If you don't immediately retreat into meditation, you will be forced to withdraw from this realm. But Mata, he struggled inside to find some excuse, but it was too late. A booming voice rang out from one of the sages. Jaya, you have crossed all limits. We have tolerated your insults to us, 
but cannot tolerate the insult to this woman sage, a woman honored throughout the three worlds. Your emotions are more fit for the human world. Thus, I curse you to be born seven times in the material realm, where you will have to squash the seeds of your negative emotions. Beware, for they will multiply a thousandfold, and you will see the damage you have inflicted. If you do not purify yourself, only the Lord will be able to release you. Narayan manifested himself, and Jaya fell at his feet, crying out, Lord, save me from this curse. I will withdraw myself into meditation now. It is too late, Jaya, Narayan replied sorrowfully. I tried to counsel you, as did Narayani, but you took no heed. This is the result of your thoughts and deeds. No being can escape his own mind. It is that which determines his future. You are aware of this law and yet did not consider it. Jaya continued to plead his case, but Narayan said, the curse of a sage cannot be undone, but it can be ameliorated. The time will be condensed and you will need only three births on earth to work through these illusions of yours, but your own deeds will determine whether you can return here or not. If you enter into deep tapasya over time, you'll be able to free yourself of anger, pride and lust and return here. But if you allow them to grow and cause home to the, harm to the natural realm, your return will not be possible. Jaya turned to Mata and cried out, Mata, do not abandon me. You can prevent this. Tell me what I should do. Looking at him with great compassion, she replied, you have already caused much harm. Your negative thoughts have already filtered into the denser realms, creating instability. You have great powers, Jaya, and can reverse this damage. But if you do not heed Narayan's warning, you will sow great conflict, conflict such as earth has not seen. And then he and I both will need to come redeem you. It will be a brutal battle. So I plead with you to seclude yourself on earth and go into deep meditation. Meditate on Mahadev. He will guide you on your tapasya. Mata, he cried, but his form was already dissolving, preparing to take birth on earth. So this is the curse that led to the birth of Ravana. I wanted to tell the story because it's the seeds of his anger and his pride and his greed and his lust that created the separation from the divine reality. Now, in a more minor way, these are the challenges that we face, all humans face, that create the separation, our separation from the divine reality. <clears throat> whenever we are in a state of anger, whenever we feel pride arising or greed, wanting the wanting, grasping, we are creating that separation and we are exiling ourselves from the divine reality. So this is, as, this is an extreme example of what we all have to encounter in one way when we fail to extinguish those seeds within ourselves, we are exiling ourselves from the divine state of being. So this is only part of the story. To put the story in context and see what happens to Jaya when he falls into the human realm. His first incarnation is not that of Ravana, it's that of a powerful demon. So now I'm gonna pick up the story this is from a book that I'm, I'm working on now called Rukmini and the Turning of Time. Now Rukmini is, is, is the wife of Krishna, Krishna being the, um, um, also an avatar of Narayan, uh, the, the Ram's next birth. Uh, and in the Vishnu Puranas, it says Rukmini is the avatar of Narayani, Sita's next birth. But there's le very little about her in the Mahabharata. And I've, wondered about that. Why is there not more? There's just a, a little clip about Rukmini uh, uh, being uh, as a princess and her brother Rukmi betrothing her to this Raja Shishup Shishupala, Shishupala. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Krishna comes 
and rescues her from, from just on the day that she's supposed to marry him, Krishna comes and rescues him. Tishupala is Krishna's cousin and um, said to be the last incarnation of, of Ravan. And so um, this is the continuation of that story that, be, that began long ago, the story that was, took place during Ram and Sita's time with their battle with Ravana. Now there's a subsequent story. So the passage I'm gonna read is in the middle of the book and it has to do with the killing of Shishapala by Krishna, which occurs, that's the last, you know, he, he has come to free him for the last time. And it takes place during the coronation ceremony of Raja Yudhisthira. I'm sure most of you have read the Mahabharata, the great battle that takes place within this family between the, the Kurus and the Pandavas and Krishna being a cousin to them, the Pandavas and a dear friend of the Pandavas, Arjuna and the others is going to the, the coronation. And uh, Rukmini, of course, as his wife has to go to this grand ceremony, but Krishna's got several wives and, and there's another wife who also, Sachibama, who also wants to go. Rukmini knows exactly what's gonna take place this is the middle of the story. So we've gotten to know Rukmini by the time we come to this episode. The story is told uh, uh, through the eyes of a woman in Dwarka, who's the rebirth of Manakshi. So there are two women, uh, uh, her name is Sujata and um, Amala, her dear, dear friend and sister. And they both were in the middle of the story now, have, have a hist they have a long, uh, history with Rukmini and many things have happened already, but now these two women are walking in the forest. News have come, has come back of Shishapala's killing and everybody's up on edge. What's gonna happen now? There's talk of war, there's talk of many, many things. What's gonna happen now? Shishapala is an ally of Duryodhana who's, um, who's the opponent of, of Arjuna. And so things are getting all confused. So these two women, are, are talking about this as they're walking in the forest. It's told through the, through the, through the uh, words of one of the women, Sujata. As we walked and watched the animal forests, our minds settled. Before long, we came to an opening in the forest and sat to talk, to confide in one another, as we so often did. But as we sat down, we heard a woman's voice from not far away. I grew nervous, but Amala recognized the voice as that of Anjali. Now Anjali is the attendant, close attendant of Rukmini, is with her, a great yogini in her own right. Anjali is here, let us greet her. She will know the true story of Raja Shishupala's killing. We rose and followed the voice and soon we came to a small gathering of women sages. We rose uh, um, um, who were seated on the forest floor in a circle with Anjali. I didn't recognize any of them and so hesitated to approach. Amala, we should not be here, I whispered as I began to draw back, but she edged forward. No doubt Anjali is explaining what happened to Indra Prasna. She was there, I want to hear. Still, I held back. There's no harm in listening, Sujata, we won't disturb them. At that moment, Anjali saw us and nodded that we could join a group. Seating ourselves apart from them, we listened to the discussion. One of the women sages spoke about the fear among people that war was approaching, that the killing of Raja Shishapalas was the harbinger of a great disaster. Another asked why Sri Krishna had killed him in such a public manner in front of all the Rajas. He was a close friend of Rani Rukmini's brother. Would he not retaliate? Where would all of this lead? Another of the women ascetics asked, Anjali, you were there. You know Mata's thinking. You understand the deeper meaning of Sri Krishna's actions. What is this really about? This is a moment of great celebration, Anjali began very quietly and slowly. The ending of a story that began long ago and the beginning of another series of events. But where do I begin? I have to go so far back in time. 
Pausing for a few minutes, she turned thoughtful and then started to narrate. You all know the story of Matasita's entry into Sri Lanka, into Lanka and, the, and event, the eventual killing of Ravana by Sri Ram. But you may not know what led up to the time to his birth as Ravana. You may know who he was originally, the devotee Jaya, who was cast out of that high celestial realm because of the impurity of his thoughts and the waves of disturbance he was creating in that subtle world of light. But what happened after he was forcibly exiled from Vakunta? She paused and looked around at the women sages whose eyes were all turned to her. Anjali began again. As I was seated beside Mata before the yagna was to begin in Indraprastha, while everyone was eagerly awaiting the great coronation ceremony, which was about to take place in that grand setting, Mata drew my attention within and showed me internally what had taken place in the distant past. I saw it all before my inner eye. I was drawn back to a time eons ago. She paused and closed her eyes and for several moments, a deep silence descended over the group. After a little while, still with closed eyes, she began to describe what she had seen. As Jaya was descending into human birth, Mata Narayani realized he would gain much power on earth. When a being falls from a high realm and takes birth in the human or demon race, their powers grow exponentially. He would be able to dominate all living creatures. It was the ascending Sata Yuga, a time of growing well-being and spiritual attunement. He could disrupt it all. Narayani knew she would need to find a more powerful being to counteract the negative effects someone who would be willing to leave the beautiful celestial world of Vakunta and take birth among the demons. Someone who could preserve the upward movement of the ascending Satya Yuga and not let the earth spin into chaos. She knew who to call upon and so she went to him, the one most beloved to her. A high deva seated in a beautiful garden absorbed in divine bliss, in unbroken union with the Lord. As the most melodious songs filled the air, songs of love and devotion, these were his songs which sprung spontaneously from him. Even before he heard the approach of her gentle footsteps, before the words were even formed in that omniscient mind, the Blessed One knew her will and bowing low to touch his forehead to the ground, he whispered with unmoving lips, Mata, I will go. Then she stood before him and showed him the trials he would endure. No matter, he replied with unspoken words, to serve you is my only will. The only cause of suffering is the separation from my Lord. Your union with the divine reality can never be broken, she assured him. That is why I've come to you, to preserve the well-being of the creatures on earth and of the one we know as Jaya, for he will fall into great pride and anger and his wrath could cause great destruction to others and to himself. Then she promised to be with him every moment of his physical incarnation, as he was making a great sacrifice for the well-being of so many. Now, that Deva knew that when one takes physical birth, there is a great forgetting. The memory of his true nature would be suppressed, and so he would lose awareness of the celestial world from which he came. But all he cared for was to remember the Lord. As he prepared for his upcoming trial, Narayan appeared and gave him the sacred mantra, telling him that by reciting that mantra, he would counteract many of the negative effects 
of Hiranyakashipu, the form Jaya had already taken, and consume some of the harmful karma that this powerful demon was generating. With this guidance, he took birth as the son of Hiranyakashipu and became the one we know as Prahlad. We all know of his trials and how Hiranyakashipu, so impressed with his own powers, really thought himself the Lord of the world and demanded worship from all quarters. He conquered large portions of the earth and was worshiped as a God, but out of fear, not out of love. He generated much fear on earth and much false perceptions of the, of the divine. Fear of him even entered the lower celestial worlds. But Prahlad was there to subtly remind him of the truth. Ultimately, Narayan had to come and free him from his delusion. This is widely known. What is not known is that when he lay dying, Narayani appeared and lifted his spirit from his body. As Haranya Kashipu lay in a state of deep sleep, she traversed the universe and carried him to a distant cave where Mata Poverty was waiting. There these two great Mahadevis stayed with him as he experienced the darkest of realms worlds ruled by anger, fear, and greed. They remained by his side so he wouldn't become locked in the darkness of those realms. And when they saw his memories of his life as Hiranyakashipu slowly sink into the hidden quarters of his mind, they awakened him. But before he regained consciousness, Parvati Ma told Narayani that she would watch over him and instruct him on meditation practices that, so that he would not be so destructive in his next birth. Then Narayani took her leave. Anjali paused and opened her eyes. What became of Prahlad? asked one of the women. Another woman responded. My Guruji, Sage Matrei, once told me that Prahlad brought such love to the earth that he changed the way humans related to the devatas. He replaced fear with love. He taught that love is the foundation of all, the very cause of all we see. He taught that the devas and devis have such love for humankind, a love beyond anything we can experience on earth. Anjali smiled. I have heard much about Sage Matre's teachings on love. And I do believe it was Prahlad who brought humans a taste of celestial love during the Satya Yuga. I have heard that he had no interest in ruling and released many of the lands that his father had conquered, believing that each region should rule itself. But we have heard that he defeated Indra and even conquered the three worlds, replied one of the women in surprise. The devotee of Sage Maitreya smiled and replied, my Guruji said he conquered with love, not might. This was a misunderstanding, she told me. It was not that he conquered Interdev through force, but rather that Interdev was so overwhelmed by Prahlad's love that he stepped aside and allowed Prahlad to guide the heavenly world. The women continued to discuss what Prahlad had contributed to the Satya Yuga, a deeper understanding of the devas opening their higher senses so they could see and hear them. When Anjali interrupted with a smile and asked, we can continue discussing Prahlad, but didn't you call me here for the story about Raja Shishupala? They all nodded and fell quiet. And Anjali picked up where she had left off. I have not yet even come to the part about Ravana. After the death of Hiranyakashipu, that soul spent thousands of years under the guidance of Parvati Ma, developing a great devotion to Mahadev. But his love was conditional. It was not pure like that of Prahlad, who sought nothing in return. <clears throat> as long as he gained mental powers from his meditations, that soul continued his devotions. And so it was that when Narayan and Narayani took birth as Sri Ram and Matasita, he took birth in the form of Ravana, from a Rakshaksha mother 
and a sage father, a father who was very wise. It was now the descending Treta Yuga and the Rakshakshas were growing in strength. And Ravana was given an opportunity and a choice, which path would he pursue? That of his mother, seeking greater power and control, or that of his father seeking wisdom. His mother was adept at magical practices and Ravana quickly learned from her how to enter and control people's minds. He gained many mystical powers. Sadly, thousands of years of practice did not dissolve his anger and pride. And this time, an unquenchable lust took over. He was not as dangerous as Hiranya Shakapu and he would not dominate the earth. Thousands of years spent in meditation has subdued some of his negative traits, but his pride was such that he believed himself to be more powerful than he actually was. His long meditation practice had dissolved much of his karma from his actions as Hiranyakashipu, but now he was creating new karma through his actions as Ravana. One of Mata's reasons for entering Lanka was to dissolve some of his karma and her tapasya during his time in Lanka helped to do this. Her goal and that of Narayan was to prevent further harm to the creative worlds and to prevent their devotee from falling into that endless pit of darkness, which would keep him trapped in a sea of delusion for eons. Such is the nature of their love. After Sri Ram had killed Ravana, as Mata was seated deep in meditation, she again left her body and lifted his spirit, whisking it away to the same cave where Parvatima was waiting. This time it would be different. As Ravana had lay dying and as Sri Ram had spoken words of love, words, loving words to him, a spark of memory had been awakened. Parvatima would be able to help free him from much of the karma he had accrued during his life as Ravana, but he was not yet fully free of the curse and would have to take one more life in the human realm. Before this soul took birth, Mahadev appeared to him and that soul pleaded with Mahadev to withdraw all of his powers so that he would be no different from any other human when he took birth on earth. Mahadev did that. And after a few thousand years had passed, the soul was born again into the human realm as the son of Raja Damagosha, the king of Chedi, cousin to Sri Krishna and a close friend and ally of Mata's brother, Rukmi. It was now the, 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 the end of the descending Dwapara Yuga. Anjali paused as some of the women gasped in surprise. Shishapala had been Ravana, one asked. Anjali nodded. That is why events had to unfold as they did. Ravana had kidnapped Mata in her life as Sita. This time, Sri Krishna kidnapped her on the day of her arranged marriage to Shishapala. That was the karmic return. Anjali let out a small laugh. But that drama was all prearranged by our Mata. In her playful way, she wanted to teach that, is, that soul a lesson about kidnapping. Never was there any possibility that her marriage to Shishupala would take place. She allowed it to appear that way, knowing how it would end. You all know that Shishupala was born with a serious deformity. But when Sri Krishna came to visit his aunt, and greeted the new baby. The very moment he lifted and embraced his cousin, the deformity disappeared. You can imagine how grateful the aunt was. She showered love upon Sri Krishna every time she saw him and always spoke his praise. But her love for her nephew caused her son to resent and hate his cousin. So every time Sri Krishna would visit his aunt, Shishapala would insult him with all sorts of horrible words. Sri Krishna didn't care, but his aunt was much distressed and begged her nephew to excuse her wayward son. At one point, Sri Krishna said to Shishapala, 
I will excuse you 100 times, but after that, you will have to reap the result of your words. You can imagine how Shishupala's anger increased when Sri Krishna took Rani Rukmini as his wife on the very day that she was supposed to marry Shishupala. She was the one Shishupala knew had been promised to him. Anjali paused again as the woman absorbed the story. Then she continued, now this brings us up to the present. I was with Mata in Dwarka when she learned of the upcoming coronation ceremony of Maharaja Yudhisthira in Indrapras. She knew that she had to attend, but this time Rani Satyabhama desperately wanted to go as well. It was unusual for both of them to be present, but Mata agreed because Satyabhama is so very close with Rani Jopati. Mata then asked me to accompany her and to stay by her side at all times. Once we arrived in Indraprasa, Mata became quiet and throughout the various ceremonies, she was withdrawn. Then the time came for the coronation. We were all gathered in the hall for the coronation, cer coronation ceremony. Mata had insisted in sitting in the back of the gathering where she could not be seen. And she asked Satyabhama to sit in the more prominent place with the Rani, with the other Ranis. I wondered why she had done this, but I never questioned her and knew there was a purpose. As soon as we entered, she drew my attention within and showed me the events of the distant past, which I have just shared with you, the history of Jaya's fall. I don't know for how long I was in that state. It could have been minutes or hours. <clears throat> I was far away witnessing all that I've just relayed to you. And then at a certain moment, I was drawn back to the outer world by the sound of a loud threatening voice. It was Raja Shishapala hurling insults at Sri Krishna in front of all the Rajas from all of Bharat we would gather there, all the esteemed people, all the dignitaries of that region. Here was Shishapala standing, hurling one insult after another, Sri Krishna. Then I heard Sri Krishna say quietly and calmly, Shishapala, remember the count. You have just surpassed 100 insults. Ignoring this remark, he continued. I turned to Mata and saw tears gathering in her eyes. Then I heard her whisper, Anjali, take care for this body. Shishapala's insults continued and Sri Krishna stood there calmly. He had passed 100 that were to be forgiven and still Sri Krishna did not act. It was only when his insults turned to Rani Rukmini that suddenly with just the slightest movement of his finger, a flash of lightning blew from Sri Krishna, hurling so fast one could barely see that bolt of light. And in a split second, Raja Shishupala was decapitated. At that moment, I saw Mata's spirit rise from her body, which then slumped over. Fortunately, I had the presence of mind to hold her body and prop it up so no one would notice. I saw her drift over to where Shishapala's body lay and lift his spirit from his corpse and off they flew. Then I was able to watch as she took him to that cave where Parajima was waiting. Then I saw him awaken. Mahadev appeared in that cave as did Narayan. And for the first time since his departure from Vakunta, that soul, Jaya, saw his beloved Narayan and Narayani. Filled with shame over what had transpired through his three incarnations, he could not look at them. And so with eyes cast down, he fully prostrated himself. It was Mata who lifted him and raised his face saying, it is over now. I see how you have grown in understanding. I must go find the four Kumaras and pay homage in gratitude for what they have done for me. I ache over the way I offended them, he murmured in a subdued tone. 
They took no offense, Jaya. What they did in cursing you was for your own benefit, so you could free yourself of the burdens of anger and pride, replied Mata. Then turning to Narayan, he asked to be allowed to compensate for those 108 insults he had cast at him. Let me do 108 benevolent acts liberate 108 souls from the suffering. Then after a pause, he added, no, 108 is not enough. For every harm I have caused, I will bring that much benefit to the created worlds. So be it, replied Narayan. Anjali paused and reminded everyone. As I watched this cosmic scene unfold, I was also aware that we were still in the Coronation Hall. Both scenes were unfolding simultaneously. It was as if time and space had disappeared. By now, Mata's body had returned to its normal state. Chaos had broken out in the hall and Mata whispered to me, let us retreat. I led her back to her room, holding her arm. I aided her as we walked, still aware of her presence in that distant cave with Jaya, counseling him on how to go about the task he had set for himself. She was both with me, walking back to her quarters, and with Jaya and Narayan and Mahadev and Parvajima in the cave, just as Sri Krishna was in the hall, which had now been thrown into confusion and was also present in that distant cave. This is the nature of omnipresence. Anjali stopped speaking. Then turning to the woman who had asked why Sri Krishna had killed Rajesh Shishapala in such a public and humiliating way in front of all the other Rajas who had gathered, Anjali said, you see Darshana, by killing him before that esteemed assembly of Rajas and Ranis and ministers, before all the Maharajas of Bharat, he was freeing Jaya from the last bit of ego, from his arrogance. That ego has now been destroyed, she said quietly. And yes, Sri Krishna has also lit the spark that will now burn through this whole region and we can only watch as the un events unfold. As I said earlier, this is the ending of one story and the beginning of another. For a long time, there was silence and the group naturally shifted into the meditative state. Dust began to settle around, bringing with it a mist that gave the forest a most unearthly appearance. I looked around at the gathering. All the women were deep in meditation. I whispered to Amala that it was time for us to leave as darkness would soon prevent us from finding our way out of the forest. We rose and turning slowly began to withdraw when we heard one of the women ask, where is Mata now? She's back in Dwarka in the palace and still in that cave. I see her in both places. She is there in her quarters and also there. Anjali replied in a far away voice. And here as well came a voice, which I recognized immediately as that of Mata. Amala and I had walked a little distance from the group, but now we turned to see Mata's form appear out of nowhere. And then in an instant, in an instant, they all disappeared. Mata, Anjali, and the women sages were gone. I ran back to where they had all been seating, sitting, sitting, but there was no trace of them. I turned to Amala and said in, in confusion, what is the meaning of this, I asked. She smiled. That is the nature of our Mata. A subtle light lit the pathway that led us out of the forest. And I knew that light had been sent by Mata we would not have found our way out of there without it. Later that night in my room, I sat mesmerized by all I had heard, still questioning whether it had been real or whether Amala and I had entered together some dream world and imagined it all. 
I could not know, but I was left with the question, could Alvani Rukmini Almata truly have been Matasita? So that, that is the complete story. <laughs> and I think it is so relevant to each one of us uh, because there are, there are the elements of truth that apply to all of us. As I said before, it is, it is um, our ego which creates this illusion of separation. In truth, in a moment, we can all be in that state of divine union. We can all be in Bakunta, except for the, 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 the seeds that still remain within us. And uh, you see again and again, that soul was advised to go into meditation as that is the way to eradicate these seeds. And then uh, after his time as, um, as Avanya Shakapu, when Parvati uh, works with him, uh, to help him undergo those austerities. We know that Ravana, and by the time he was born as Ravana, he was a great devotee of Mahadev, considered himself to be the greatest devotee of Mahadev because he had spent thousands of years. I mean, this whole story unfolds over maybe 10,000 years from the beginning of when he it takes four Ms. Ranya Shakapu until the end, Shishupala. And <clears throat> he, 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 the tapasi he had undergone, had undergone before he takes birth as Ravana had given him uh, uh, an incredible mental power. Uh, so even though he, he did not have um, uh, the powers of Ravanya Shakapur to conquer the, the whole, the three worlds or much of it, uh, he, he had mental, mental powers because of his, the boons he had gotten from uh, of, of Mahadev. And again, it shows how all the forces of the universe come together for the enlightenment of each one of us. Um, I, I've shown in the Untold Story of Sita, and again, is, is shown here. Um, there's a, a later section in the book where uh, the community sends Arjuna to go meditate on Mahadev. This is the end of the period, period of, of, of exile. Uh, and through his intense tapasya and meditation on Mahadev, he gains many of the mental powers that enable him to have the success that he has later in the war. Um, but the, 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 the cosmic forces um, of, of creation, preservation, and transformation, both of the feminine and masculine aspects, uh, we see them in their, in, their, in their forms, but they're formless and, and in form, both. These, these forces work together. Uh, and when we talk about the consciousness of Sita, the consciousness of Narayani, talk about omniscience and omnipresence. That is the very nature, that is our nature as well, only we have these blockages which prevent us from living in that consciousness. Um, but my, the, this is just a, what I, sh, we've, what I told was just a small indication of that omnipresence. Mata Sita, Sri Ram is with every one of us working with us for our own liberation. Just like all the gopis, every gopi had Krishna with her. Krishna was not limited to Radha. Every single gopi who was dancing was dancing with Sri Krishna. And Sri Krishna can manifest, you know, uh, uh, as another aspect of Narayan, can, act, can, can manifest, um, uh, unfold <laughs> multiple times <laughs> throughout the universe, when you think of, of the, 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 the trillions of beings that exist, it's beyond what our human minds can comprehend, that consciousness uh, of omnipresence. One, it's experiential, one can experience it, but one cannot speak of it. And so the consciousness of the divine can be experienced because it is our own nature, but we don't have the words to express it. And so um, in, 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 in a, another one of my books, which I've just finished, which called, um, it's called the, when the bright moon um, rises, the, un, the awakening of ancient memories goes back to the Vedic times. And uh, when, when people could actually see the deities and it describes a little bit of the celestial worlds. 
But at the end, there are no words to describe those worlds. You know, I tried to describe a little bit of, there are no words to describe what comes in. One can experience it and then one can try to find human words, but we are so limited uh, in, in our, not just in our words, but in our ability, our, in our concepts. So how can, how can these limitations cannot hold the unlimited? And yet we try to speak about it. We try in, in that period of time that I, that I refer to the Vedic period, which is like, you know, 8,000 BCE and earlier, there was an exchange of thought of images. So the rishis were able to convey an, uh, an experience through, a, through an, a mental exchange. They didn't have to use words. Words is actually, language is actually a decline. Um, uh, just like uh, people talk about, you know, when the Vedas were written down, um, that, that was during a much great, that, during a decline that they didn't need to be written down because everything was held in the memory. The capacity at that time was much greater. And so we're living today with a reduced capacity. And so we have to use language and we have to, have to use writing uh, to convey uh, our experiences. But in that higher time, it was just the transmission of thought, which is often how, th which is how things take place in the higher world. It's just a, 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 an exchange of mental images. Um, so I wanna talk about, uh, to, put it, to put this into context a little bit about, um, it says in the, in the Vishnu Puranas that every time um, Vishnu takes form, all of the avatars, he's accompanied by Narayani. And yet she's never mentioned until Sita, which is interesting to me, um, why she's never mentioned. And at some point I'm gonna delve into that of, of, of um, uh, so, so there are many stories about uh, the different uh, avatars, um, but it, 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 it came to me at one point that, that the ancient rishis in describing the incarnations of Narayan, they were describing evolution. That Narayan and Narayani, that, that cosmic force that maintains life that maintains the universe incarnates to help push evolution forward. So they incarnate, incarnated as sea life, as a fish, to help that form of life take the next step in evolution. They incarnated then as a reptile to help that form of life take the next leap, because it's a leap. Evolution is a leap forward. How does that leap happen? There has to be some conscious force which enables the, uh, the, the, the form to take the next leap. And then uh, 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 there's the, um, uh, um, the, 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 the tortoise and then uh, the boar, which is the, which is the, the, the upright animal, the animal that, 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 that walks on, uh, uh, on earth. Um, and, then, and then we have um, uh, Narasimha, which is, we have the, the dwar Vam Vamana, um, each one was a step forward in evolution. And so what did, what did Ram and Sita bring aside from uh, um, of, of, of helping to, to uh, free the whole region of the Rakshakshas and, and set the foundation for a civilization, uh, enable the, the hermitages to, to continue on and et cetera, to, to free the world from the negative energies. They were also setting ideals in the human mind, setting ideals for a civilization that were able to guide civilization forward. And I say it in the, in the, in the untold um, story of, of uh, Sita that uh, Janak Baba had a great influence on, on Rama. Someone asked me recently who had read the book, um, that, that this surprised her, she said, because she thought that Dasarat was the main influence on him. And I said, the whole, I, in my understanding, the whole purpose of the union of these two uh, uh, kingdoms was to bring together what Dasarat had to offer and what Janak Baba had to offer. Uh, 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 Ayodhya was, had, was a center of power. It was, a, um, yes. it was an empire really, it, it had all the elements of that. 
Mithila was a center of knowledge and Janak Baba <clears throat> had foresight to know that way into the future of, of humankind, uh, there would have to be self-governance. Self-governance means not only uh, in the political sense, but in the sense of governing your own self, of learning how to behave, of learning one's limitations, how to behave in a civilized society. And one couldn't overstep, one couldn't seek too much for oneself. If you took much from, too much for oneself, you're taking from someone else. So it's maintaining this balance. And so Sita was born into this kingdom because it was all about how to maintain a balance within a society. And, and, and Matilda was much smaller than um, Ayodhya. So uh, Kosala, the king, the greater kingdom, I mean. Um, and so he was able to know every family. He was able to need, know the needs of every family. And if there was any uh, want an illness or, or uh, a, a deprivation of any way, he was able to provide for that. And so he, he was a, um, um, uh, had an intimate relationship with all of the um, people within his kingdom. This is something that Ram took as an ideal. And, 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 in, and in his own reign, we see that in the second part of the book, how he put people together that he knew needed to be together. He, 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 he was able to uh, govern much from the interior plane, not just in the outer way. He knew how to, what, what the needs of the, the individuals and the people. And so he ruled from the inner plane as much as from the outer. And this was, we've fallen so far from this ideal today, right? <laughs> but this is the ideal that is still, uh, um, that's still within many of us. That is amazing that, that, you know, so many thousands of years later, the ideals that were set for them, that was on the human level. So I was talking before about the, the, the greater consciousness of, of Narayan and Narayani, where they're work, working with each individual, uh, uh, awakening the higher or higher nature and helping us overcome our, our lower impulses. And yet in the human realm, they, they also were functioning to create these ideals that would set be a model for civilization. Um, and I also say that, that um, uh, in Matilla, the very seeds of democracy were set because uh, uh, Janak Baba tried to enable people to take as much responsibility as possible for their own things that related to their life. Uh, and so, so um, and this continued, you know, for, for quite a while uh, and is still a model, you know, what you might call localization. So things could take place at the local level. So the local communities could, could, could take care for their local environment and take care for their food and take care for these things. That was, that was a model that was set in his time. And so you might say those are the seeds of democracy where people are responsibility for, ru ru for, for ruling themselves ruling their locality. And so um, I think, I think it's, it's important for us now to see how we can implement these ideals in the world today, which is, has fallen so far away from that. Um, and so how, what, how can they be translated? Um, how can we, they be translated um, into our work today in the world? Now I want to tell two stories, one from my personal life uh, that happened to me last year and one from um, a, a, a dear friend, a young woman who lives in China, who's translated the untold story of Sita into Chinese. And she, uh, the book affected her very deeply. When she asked, she had translated my, my first book, My Journey Through Time, uh, spiritual, Mem spiritual Memoir of Life, Death and Rebirth, where I recount many of my previous births. And she um, going from just the last last few. And then when I told her about the Sita book, and she said she wanted to translate it. And I, I said, do you think this will be have appeal for the Chinese audience? Um, she, she had been to India and she was very um, taken with the teachings of Sri Aurobindo. And so she wanted to translate it. She was very, very moved by the book, very touched by the book and started sharing it with others. 
And then a few months ago, maybe it was a, it may a month or so ago, she emailed me and she said that um, uh, she'd been, she had a difficult situation in her life. Her father had, um, parents were divorced. Her father had remarried a much younger woman and now was going through a second divorce. She'd been alienated from him and he was struggling and suffering tremendously. And, and she was struggling within herself what to do. And then she said to herself, what would Mata do? And she knew she had to reach out to her father. And so she reached out and she healed the relationship that had been broken for many, many years. And she was able to give him comfort during this trial in her life. And, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I thought to myself, she's really internalized this book and she has brought Mata into her day-to-day -day life, into her challenges. I did the same thing. Something happened to me. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of this. I, I, I'm gonna tell it very truthfully. Uh, in my first book, My Journey Through Time, I, I talk about a life um, in India, in Kashi during the uh, 1600s, um, where um, a certain time in that life, there were communal tensions, communal tensions, and my husband and I left and we left for a, a pilgrimage into the Himalayas. And that's the story that I told. Uh, I was taking my son to India a year ago and, and his family. And he said that he wanted to go to, to the Ajanta Caves. And so I started looking to where the Ajanta Caves were and I realized they were in, in, in Rangabad. Rangabad, I said to myself. And then my memories came back about Aurangzeb who had been the emperor during that life that I had just described when I lived in Kashi. And I remembered the destruction of the Kashi Vishwanath temple. And I remembered the pain that it had caused me. The, I still get emotional <laughs> when I talk about it. <laughs> it was, and then I remembered the anger and the hatred that had risen in me toward this emperor who had done that. And I couldn't get rid of that anger. I was walking around saying, here he is, a whole town is named after him, a whole university is named after him. And yet he caused such harm. To me, he was the Ravana of that time. So I, I started looking up um, where his grave was. I found out, so I said to myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the, the, the caves, I'm gonna go to that place, I'm gonna go to his grave and I'm gonna spit on it. It's just gonna make me feel better to do that. <laughs> I'm not proud to say this, this is what was my thinking. <laughs> and so I started researching and I found that it was an unmarked grave in a Sufi shrine. Now I have great reverence for the Sufis and I said, oh, in the Sufi shrine, how am I gonna go there and spit on it? And I said, well, I'm gonna do it. I'll just cover my face and just do it. And, and then um, I started reading that at the end of his life, a lot of the Sufis had gathered in that place, probably to dissolve so much of the, of the negative energies that he had fostered. And so I'm planning my trip. I'm gonna go do this and go there and just, free, just do this, I have to do this. And then I had a dream and I had been praying to, 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 to Mata I didn't know how to free myself from that. What do you do when you have this anger toward a man that died 400 years ago? You can't go talk it out. You can't go work it through. What do you do? And so I was praying and praying. I didn't want to walk around with this anger that was consuming me. And so then I had a dream. And in the dream, I was, there was, a, I was in a broken down temple, a temple that had been destroyed and there were the ruins. And I was walking through the ruins and I met a man and the man said, have you come to see the Sufi? And I said, which Sufi? He said, oh, there's an old Sufi sitting in the ruins over there. You can go see him. I said, what's his name? He told me his name and I said, oh, I guess I know that Sufi. I'll go visit him. I'll go, I'll go pay my respect to him. So I walked over the ruins and, and I finally came to an old dirty Sufi sitting in a corner a few people around him and he was humble and he was bowed and he was, it was, a, you know, uh, uh, he was in a very lowly state in terms of his appearance. And then I stood there and he looked up at me and I said, oh my God, that's wrong, Sam. 
and my anger disappeared. And I woke up and I was so grateful that Mata had released me from that anger. Now, this is a difficult thing because, you know, I've worked for many years in, with people who, in conflict areas where there is a lot of anger. I've worked with Israelis and Palestinians, with Iraqis, Afghanis, and Sudan. I mean, it's very hard to know how to dissolve that anger that, that um, uh, a lot of, that comes from, I mean, when we take a new birth, we carry with us a lot of, unless we're doing a lot of practice, we carry with us our emotions um, that we've experienced in the past. And which is why meditation practice is so, we have the subscars, is so important. Um, but it takes a long time. It takes a lot, one has to have a lot of patience one can't expect within one lifetime. Or, you, know, you say, oh, I've been meditating 40 years. Sounds like a long time, <laughs> but, but it's, a, it's a snippet of time <laughs> that you've been doing this sadhana. And I had been carrying around this anger within me for many hundreds of years. And my meditation, until I consciously turned to Mata, and asked to be free of this anger. That's what I was given this dream. And somehow the anger was released. And so I see the story of Ravana as applying in different ways to each one of us. You know, uh, we all have seeds uh, uh, of, of greed. The more conscious we are, the more mindful, the more we can catch them in their seed form and, and not allow us to be consumed by them. And so that is the, that is the key. And meditation practices, we're told, uh, helps, helps uh, release some scars. It helps, it helps burn them up. Um, so, so, and yet we all need the guidance of whatever form of the divine is most beloved to us. And sometimes different forms. Um, in that life, when I lived in Kashi, I was a devotee of Durga. And, and because I had left, I hadn't, and, and not had an experience of Durga, but I was med praying my whole life. And it was when I was left for hermitage, uh, when I was left for, for a pilgrimage to the, to the uh, Himalayas, and my husband and I wandered, we finally ended up in Kashmir. And it was in the jungles of Kashmir, in the forests of Kashmir, that I met a woman hermit who gave me the experience of Durga in that life. Had that temple not been destroyed, I would not have gone on pilgrimage. I would not have counted that woman hermit and perhaps not have had the experience of Durga. And, and so if my son had not asked to go to the Ajanta caves and not had not started that process, I might not have had the memory, uh, allowed all my anger toward Ramzeb to come up, which had been, you know, he, which had been repressed, had been suppressed. I've lived my life not aware of that, but it came forth with, with such a force um, that it was really creating a lot of suffering for me. Uh, uh, and so uh, everything that comes to us, uh, even the misfortunes that come to us, um, we see that, that um, Menakshi was born into a, into a cursed family. She herself, and in this book, When the Bright Moon Rises, goes back to the Vedic age when she had received the curse. So it describes, I mean, when you see the whole picture, it's mind boggling. So back in the Vedic age, she had transgressed in such a way that she was cursed. And, but there was this woman sage who blessed her that the curse would come to fruition during the most auspicious of times and had given her the blessing to have it take place during the time Sita was born. And so she was born into a family that had been cursed with great misfortune. She had been cursed that she would lose all of her loved ones. And so she did, she lost her mother and her brother and then her father and, and would have had a life of great misfortune had not she also had been blessed to be born during the time of Sita, where her family was taken in as servants to that household. So we all have to struggle to see the bigger picture. 
if you look at Ravan, you know, I mean, Ravan is, is uh, you know, we talk about, there have been other Ravans, we have Ravans now wandering the earth, you know, people who are causing great harm. Um, could they have been Jayas at one time? Um, um, so it makes you realize that you don't know who anybody is. And we, we, we can't really, we can't really judge. We can condemn the actions and we're, we must condemn the actions. I mean, there's, there's a lot of misbehavior on the earth right now. When you think of the way the earth is being destroyed, one has to, one has to call that out and one has to respond to that in a very forceful way. Rama had to, had to do what he had to do and he had to fight that battle. Uh, in the Mahabharata War, which the second part of my book on Rukmini takes, goes into the, into the hidden aspects of the Mahabharata. What was that really about? It wasn't just a fight within the kingdom. There were other things going on that made that war necessary. And Krishna's role in it and Rukmini's role in it, which again is not told. I mean, we can't just look at outer events. All of our stories are just about the outer events. This took place and this took place. But what, what, was, what was the inner cause that led to the outer manifestation. Everything on the physical plane first has a spiritual source, as a spiritual cause. And so we have to look to that spiritual cause. And so how we apply these things in our life today, when we see um, so much suffering and so much wrong being committed, and yet I'm constantly, I know many of my friends get so angry at certain individuals who are causing the harm. And I myself have to be very watchful uh, because who, who could not get angry at Ravana? Ravana's, you know, other Ravana's appear. There's, there's never, <laughs> there's not gonna be a time when there's, there's not a Ravana. <laughs> That's the nature of this polarity. Um, so how, how can we, we not get angry at that? But to try not to be angry at the soul who has fallen into deep delusion and who will have to pay the price. Who will have to pay the price because those are the laws that maintain the, the physical world, the law of cause and effect. And so um, I often remind myself of that when I see wrong being done. Um, I, I remind myself that there is ultimate justice in this world and we, we do our part to try to bring, to try to manifest justice on the earth. Um, but as much as we can, we have to try to hold the larger picture and try to invoke the cosmic powers to work through us, to the cosmic forces to work through us to recreate the balance and harmony on this planet. So uh, among the, you know, the, the, there are many, many, I could go on and on about the different messages. Um, what was the process of writing the untold story of Sita was, was a, um, an awakening experience for me. Uh, it, 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 for, 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 I was in that consciousness for two years as I wrote and rewrote that story. And of course, for me, the most touching was the love Sita showed for her servant, for her servant who was not very enlightened at that time, I must see. I mean, and looking back at my own past, I see how step by step I've gained much greater consciousness and awareness. Um, there was not much of an awakened consciousness. There was love, yes, but not much of an awakened consciousness as I see going back in time. But step by step, each life brought a greater and greater awareness. And now in this life, I have the opportunity to recall many of my, my, my past lives and also to engage in deep sadhana, which I didn't have. To be able to engage in sadhana is a gift that not everybody has. Be able to have the meditation practices. For the first time, they're readily available to, to, the, to the lay person, no matter where we are, in any station of life. In earlier times, you know, it was the, the, the recluses, the hermits, the ascetics, those who had left society, who had access to these higher practices. But now in our age, there are millions and millions of us that can engage in, in sadhana 
to help the world evolve because we're at an evolutionary moment. And it's a critical evolutionary moment as all the evolutionary moments are. Life is gonna progress or, or if it doesn't, it's, 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 it's gonna be a very tragic, tragic thing. So we all have to work for the evolution of life. And, and, and what brings that now in this particular moment is our meditation practice. And so I look at this, um, this uh, COVID retreat, this COVID pause uh, in many ways as a message of that. Okay, you are forced to stay home now. Your daily routine has been disrupted. You can't go out shopping. Uh, you, you, you don't have the luxury to be uh, uh, thoughtlessly engaged in things anymore. You are forced to stay home. You are forced to reflect. You're forced to get your priorities straight. And so all of my, I mean, there's so much suffering going on because of fear and the deaths and all that, but my spiritual friends who engage in spiritual practice have all said to me, this is an unexpected gift to us that we are forced to stay home. Let us not lose it because a year's time now, there'll be a vaccine and, and then what? Do we go back to our normal routine? Or are we gonna use this opportunity to make sure that we go back in a different way or that we don't go back to what we were before, but something new happens? This is the discussion now taking place is how do we make sure we don't go back to what was? How do we make sure we go back to a more conscious outer life? We don't know what that's gonna look like, but let us use this time. We have maybe, you know, another few months, so we don't know, because uh, this uncertainty of what's gonna happen next, of how long we're gonna be able to be in a more retreat-like state, um, we can spend more time uh, in our meditation. Um, more time tuning in um, to, to, to the higher beings who can perhaps guide us on what to do next, on, on how we can uh, push this evolution forward, how we can uh, change the collective mind. So we are a part of a collective vibrational force and our collective meditations help rise the, raise the vibrations of this, of this collective energy. And yet at the same time, because it's the nature of, of our physical plane, there are forces pulling it down. And so this is the, 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 the battle to lift up the collective and to resist those forces uh, and, and how we can do it without allowing anger uh, or fear uh, to come into play. Um, that's, that's, mm -hmm. we have, that's where we can gain the strength from Mata, from Ram, um, from Sri Krishna uh, and the others, the other manifestations of the divine to help us stay in a higher state so that we can be of service during this time. So I think, I think now um, that's pretty much all that I wanted to say. Uh, let me see if there that's, any wonderful. that's wonderful. Hmm. Maybe now we can open it up for discussion. Definitely, madam. Um, before I start this um, platform open for Q&A, I just wanted to tell you what a great wisdom sharing session that was, especially about the divine consciousness and the way you ended it up, madam, with the current state that we are in, which is this, if we can call that a COVID break. And not everyone may be at the same sadhana level as you, madam, but still, for most of us who have taken this opportunity to travel within, it is an evolutionary leap in it in our own way. So even if we have to go back at this, go back to the external world at the end of this COVID break era, we're not going to be the same person that we were before. There has already been a step change in each one of us as we try to stay in our own divine selves, trying to travel within, it has brought a lot of change, madam. And I can talk from my experience that connecting to the divine consciousness seemed like a far away thing long time before. But as you mentioned about that Chinese friend of yours 
who had had this amazing experience of connecting to Sita Ma when she was trying to apply to her daily life problem. When I started wisdom sharing, it was as if I could connect to Sita Ma's consciousness straight away. I could not have imagined this happening maybe a couple of years back. So definitely something is happening within all of us, madam, as we are sitting in this COVID break, trying to take this opportunity to travel within us and connect in some way to that divine consciousness. So I'm, I'm totally believing it. The evolutionary leap that you're talking about is already happening within each one of us, madam. And it's been really great the way you have talked about the divine realm, the divine consciousness, giving the examples of Jaya in your book story of the untold story of Sita, and also giving us glimpses from your new book, Rukmini. We have all had great curiosity and thirst for peeping into that new book that's coming up. And I think you have quenched our thirst by giving us a glimpse of what it's going to be. We just can't wait to have that, that, that book in our hands. I, I'm already just filled with anxiety, madam. Do you have any um, ETA or time about when this book is going to be released? It will be released uh, early, uh, first part of next year, probably uh, maybe March. All right. We'll, we'll excitingly, we'll be waiting for its release. I can rest assured the untold story of Sita has been a favorite book of this year. And I'm sure the Rukmini book is going to be another favorite for 2021. And thank you really for bringing this great jewels of wisdom amongst us and sharing that with us, madam. Um, I'm just going to open the um, forum for question answers. Um, I'll start with the panelist. So we've got Swarnalata, madam, on the panel who had uh, had the opportunity of translating your book in Telugu language. So Swarnalata, madam, if you can unmute yourself and um, if you could uh, ask your question or your feedback or comment to Dena, madam. You can unmute yourself, Swarnalata, madam. Uh. I'm very happy to be with you this evening, ma'am. Madam, can you switch on your video, please? Switch on. Yes. Are you able to see me? We can't. Um, but if you can't figure it out, oh. we'll try to do without the video. But it would be really great if we can see your face okay. too. Okay. But, but that's okay if you can't. Manage okay, it. even then. Yes, I'm very happy to be with you this evening. And one more thing is your untold story of Sita. It took me towards all the ages, all the ages. I lived with her. I felt as if I am the Sita and I'm experiencing all the stuff, all the stuff. For me, no questions about it, but I want to be with you to experience your vibration to experience your lovable speech. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minakshi. And thank you, Madam. Sarvaja, Madam. <laughs> thank you, Swarnalata, Madam. <laughs> Madam. Thank, thank you for your efforts in translating. That, that, thank you. That's a beautiful gift. And um, uh, my, hope, my hope is that everyone who reads this book comes into the presence of Matasita. And I do hope to meet you all when I come to India, hopefully next year. Sure, madam. Certainly, certainly I'll, I'll meet you. We all can't wait then, madam. We will be waiting for you there. I'm certain, <laughs> I certainly yes, will be traveling well. for Melbourne. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, uh, one of our participants in this um, particular session, um, Mr. Shastri has got a great sharing here, madam. He says, it's a great detailing of Mahabharata. Your wisdom sharing has been very insightful and really thanks for all the detailed explanation, Dena Madam. So Shastri sir, I have passed on your message to Dena Madam and all your appreciation for her wisdom sharing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, next we have Kavita Gupta Madam, who also had the great privilege to translate your book, The Untold Story of Sita in uh, Hindi. So, Kavita Gupta, madam, 
Um, if you can unmute yourself, which you have already done, I can see if you can uh, please come up your, with your feedback, comment or question or any sharing with Dana, madam. Yeah, hi, a warm greetings to both of you. And uh, I can only say now I'm translating this book in Hindi, which is still on, I have not completed. But uh, Dana, ma'am, I can tell one thing that reading was another, another thing, another level. And... Uh, Translating is a different ball game, I can tell you. Each line when I'm writing, I can feel so profound, so such, such a feeling as if I'm witnessing the entire episode, as if it's happening just in front of my eyes. So my humble gratitude from entire India, I can say once a book will be in, in, in Hindi for months, because majority of Indians are Hindi speaking. Mm. So mm. I think once it's there in Hindi, it'll... It'll be a revolution, I can tell you. And as far as meditation is concerned and my question for this evening, uh, you have answered major part of it, but still I'll ask my question for my viewers. Like, uh, how can Sita's consciousness, consciousness, which is so divine, which is full of love, compassion, um, sacrifice, service, how it can help in this current scenario uh, for this, you know, the reshape, the current suffering and challenge of the humanity, how it can help it. this current, those who are non-meditators, those, uh, because maximum I can feel the easiest thing, people just go to the temples, they worship the God, goddesses, and they think that the, the responsibility, the duty is over. They have not yet been, I think they've not experienced the consciousness, one being one with the Sita consciousness, still that's yet to come. That era of feeling, that oneness, uh, that can only happen through meditation. And uh, it's not that 100% or everybody on earth is meditating. Otherwise the suffering won't be here. Mm. But we see a lot of suffering, lot in corona and different ailments, different wars, China threatening India, so many things, you know. And I would also like to know something about your NGO, uh, what you are doing globally for the women, a global peace initiative. Of women. Sorry, Kavita, madam, you're breaking up. I think you've got in, enough questions for Dana uh, to start up. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank you for translating the book into, in, into Hindi. That is a great, great, great gift and contribution. I, and um, that my, I mean, my deepest wish is that this book just be given to as many people. Uh, I was very surprised um, when my friend in, in, in Beijing asked to circulate it in China. Uh, China is, uh, the book that I've just, that I finished, I was <laughs> writing the Rokmini book and then had to put it aside because another memory was coming back to me that I had to capture. And so I wrote this other book, When the Bright Moon Rises, which goes back to the Vedic period and then has a subsequent life in China. And I dedicated the book uh, to the people of India and China um, uh, uh, because I talk about the wisdom of the Taoist wisdom and the Vedic wisdom. Um, uh, uh, and the, and the, uh, the feminine aspects of both. Um, and then of course, I finished that book. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm going back and finishing up with me, the Rukmini book, but, um, my work increasingly has been now about awakening consciousness in China. There is, I mean, I, we, we have found, you know, we've worked with young people around the world, um, young environmentalists who have a spiritual practice. And we've done many gatherings of these young environmentalists. And I found that those who had the deepest practice were in China. And many of them, although they were Buddhist, had a very strong link with India. They had been to India, they had been to some of the ashrams in India, they gained a lot from India, their practice was Buddhist, but there was an integration going on. And, and so I, so you don't never hear about this in the news, right? So this, we have to separate out the political, what's happening at the political level. Um, and I know this is true in America, I see my own political level here, and then what's going on at the spiritual level is very different. And so, um, and the big question here among Americans is when is this spiritual collective gonna have enough of, a, uh, of an energy of power to really flip things? 
timing is unknown. I see that happening in China. So, and, and of course, the issues between India and China at the political level are of great concern to me. Uh, that's, that's, um, so I find myself, uh, and I finished the book just as that conflict was taking place uh, in Ladakh, and I've been to Ladakh. I've, I've been very close to that place where the conflict took place, you know, and I know the Buddhist community up there. And so I, and actually I was supposed to be going to China um, uh, this year, um, in, in, in September, actually, of course, that, that got put on hold, told me to go next year. Uh, and and um, there are people now working to, it's very hard to get things published. Right now, the Sita book's been translated into Chinese uh, and it's been quietly circulated. Uh, it hasn't been published, but they're looking to get a publisher in Hong Kong for it. Uh, and so none of this is my doing. <laughs> this, you know, this young, beautiful Chinese woman just happened to read the first book and said, do, do you have another book? And I said, well, I have this book on Sita, but I don't know if it would be meaningful to you. <laughs> and then that's the book that she's really now wanting to circulate. Uh, so so um, in a way, we are just instruments. You know, we are just instruments. We, we don't know the impact that our, our work um, when I when I published my first book, I was very um, my journey through time very anxious about it. A lot of my spiritual friends said, "You can't do this. You can't you can't do this. You can't talk about your past births." I said, "Well, maybe." But but I had a friend who was dying of pancreatic cancer, and she said to me, "You must do this, because a lot of people will be will be um, feel at ease, especially." And then subsequently, a lot of people came to me and said, "My friend has cancer. Can I send them this book?" Because a lot of people. Are afraid. They're, they're they're afraid of death, and and to know that there is no death is a great comfort to them. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that the more we can help. I mean, this is a known in India, but for a lot of the world, it's not a given. And yet, it's increasingly uh, becoming understood that life is eternal. That we go from chapter to chapter to chapter. And, and so, um, you know, now I'm asked to give talks on that. Well, how does that work? Well, what do we take with us? What, 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 is, our true, what is our true nature? You know, what is the nature of some score of these questions that come up? I think the more people can understand that, a lot of fear uh, can, can be erased. Um, so back to your question, uh, um, you know, I've, I've started to, and again, the, the, the time frame we can't know, you know, if we meditate, on peace between India and China. That could take 20 years, it could take 30 years, it could take a week, we don't know. That's not in our control. But the more of us as a collective, because I know, I know that yoga is very big in China. There are a lot of people teaching yoga in China. Uh, I was reading something that when COVID hit and the Chinese people had to stay home, they said, thank God we could do more yoga now. So um, these are undercurrents, you know, the government can control certain things, but they can't control what you do in your private time. If you're home meditating, nobody can say, stop meditating. So this is what's, there's, there is a change in this one young man in China that we know, a, a very, very deep practitioner um, who had spent quite a bit of time in, in India and now has um, joined a monastery there. He said, and he's got a woman teacher, a young woman teacher uh, in her thirties. And he said that many young technologists, people from the tech sector in China are leaving that world and now going to the monastery to learn meditation. So I see hope for the future. And this is why a lot of my work is focused on young people. Um, um, I was just talking to uh, a center. I've done some work with the, the Indica Academy in India and they just started a center for indigenous sustainability and they wanted to partner with us about how to, how to help young people understand more deeply the indigenous culture of India through agriculture, through, 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 through the medicines, the indigenous medicines. So I said to him, this was a great concern of mine because whenever I've brought together young people in India, they're, they're very uh, uh, disconnected from the spiritual the essence of the spiritual culture. And um, how do um, 
because they're surrounded with all of the modern aspects of modern life, how to help them connect more deeply. In my own, uh, in the writing of my book that I've just published, When the Bright Moon Rises, um, I talk about the, uh, there's a woman sage that I encounter and I talk about. It brought me into the experience of Indra. I had never had that experience of Indra Dev before. And when you think of all the stories, how, how he's portrayed as being like a human, petty, jealous, this, that. Right? Indra is a beautiful cosmic force. And so how to awaken in young people this memory of who these divine beings are. So I'm planning to do something there with young people. You know, we're young, I mean, 20s and 30s, probably mostly 30s, um, who, who are eager for the knowledge of, of, of the truth of what the indigenous culture was. Um, so, you know, our collective meditation is the most important thing right now, both in, 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 in helping to create greater harmony between the two ancient great cultures of India and China, because there is a lot of greatness in China in terms of the wisdom from their ancestors, you know. Um, but, um, but they didn't have the seeds of democracy. They, they've been ruled by emperors for, centralized emperors for, for millennia actually, going back uh, to BCE. So they don't have the tradition of democracy. And so uh, not to judge that, but just to say, how can we create harmony between these two great ancient cultures that are going to have, that are having enormous impact on the world and will uh, really of the future, the next, the transfer of power toward Asia. Um, so our collective meditation, we have to include China in that collective meditation. Yeah, definitely, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Here, I would like to add, I'm really thankful to you for this answer, ma'am. Because yes, you rightly said, collectively, it's a role of each and every meditator to spread the awareness and among the youth. Yes, that's most important. And to add here, yeah, ma'am, one more thing. I have also written a book for youth and that's Spiritual Alphabets. It's uh, named Metamorphosis, Transformation of Self. It's for uh, the young children and the youth. And from each alphabet, I have taken few virtues, which we all need to culcate in our day-to-day -day life. So, uh, so thank you. Welcome, English? Madam. Is the book in English? Yes, ma'am, English. Yeah. So when yeah. I come, you can you can uh, uh, give me the of book. Of course, sure, Wonderful. certainly, ma'am. And ma'am, I would also, if yeah, you can share your email ID, I can send the PDF right now. Since you have lost time now, you can read now also. Okay, anybody who wants to reach me, it's best to reach me at, at the office email. I have a GPIW email, but I but uh, I don't have access at home. So you can reach me at Dina, D-E-N-A, at Finn Partners, F like, like Frank, I-N-N, Dina at F-I-N-N-E-A-R-T-N-E-R-S, Finn Partners. And also you can send a message on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, so you can put email is what I check most frequently. Yes, so thank you, you so put much, ma'am. It would help everyone. So um, Anuradha or Saik, just put it on the chat so that others can have a preview of Madam's email um, in case they're all looking for it. Um, thank you, Kavita, Madam, and Vena, Madam. That was a great reply. I just wanted thank to you so share. Much. Yeah, thank you, Kavita. I just wanted to share um, one of the feedbacks from uh, the participants and they have a question as well. So this is Rashi um, as saying, I've spent the last few days immersed in understanding and exploring the presence of yoginis and rishis from the Vedic times. And today hearing from you all that from the Vedic times, I'm really full of awe and gratitude, madam. And she's also asking, are there any workshops or platforms that you conduct to integrate with your work that you do? Yes, um, there are workshops that I'm going to be doing, um, uh, and you can be in touch with uh, the. You can be in touch with me on email, and Marianne, who's my assistant uh, in all of this, can 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 give out information about that. And I have to say that, you know, I I I, I don't see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a servant. The consciousness of being the servant never left me. 
And so I, I but I've been asked to do certain workshops and I'm, I'm happy to share whatever knowledge I have, whatever I've gained through my, my life experience. I'm happy to share that. Great, Bena, madam. Thank you very much. We'll take that information uh, from Marianne through the platform here, Sai and Anuradha. If you can coordinate with Marianne and get that information to the viewers, please. Thank you very much. Madam, before I pa pass to the next um, person with the question, I just had one personal question on my own as I was hearing you. You did mention that Vaikuntha is a divine realm and it's very difficult to really explain that in concepts and in words because it's beyond concept. But when I was reading your book, The Untold Story of Sita, you did make a big try to explain or to show us glimpses of Vaikuntha. On what was the basis of that, madam? I mean, what did you see? I know you can't tell us exactly because it's again the words and its limitation, but can you tell us, share us a little bit about what you saw and how you try to depict in the words? In my, um, in my book, Journey Through Time, not Journey Through, The Bright Moon Rises, I also, there are three chapters in there which describe the celestial realm because I do have memories of the celestial realm. I do have I... memories of the, of the time uh, between birth. Vakunta, uh, Vakunta is, is all that we consider to be beautiful, the things that make us joyful. It is the realm of bliss. As I said, more than a place, it's a state of being. In that state of being, whatever beauty arises in the mind manifests. So it's a state, it's a, it's a state of being where you manifest things. So you manifest whatever, however beauty appears to you, whether it's through flowers or, uh, um, um, uh, 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 or song, or however beauty appeals to you, that's how it manifests. And um, I tried to describe it and how beauty manifests to me, but it's the, it's the state of, of um, only the slightest sense of separation exists in that state from the divine reality. Because in the cosmic sea upon which Narayan and Narayani rest, that is the state of unity, the state of oneness with the divine consciousness, an undifferentiated spirit. But as soon as there is a sense of separateness and a, a, a sense of, 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 of being apart from that, that slightest, so just the first level of separation, that is that state of complete, uh, still where the bliss of unity is still there, but one has a sense of distinction, of, se of separateness. That is the state um, that many of the divine beings stay in before they, um, there's a story about um, my, my, the guru of my lineage, um, uh, Mahavatar Babaji, where at one point he's thinking to shed his form and to dive back into the ocean of consciousness. And then uh, a woman, uh, Rishi appears and says, why are you doing that? He says, well, there's no distinction. What's the difference whether I keep my form or not? And she says, then if there is no distinction, then please keep your form. And so he agrees to keep his <laughs> form for the, for the duration. But it's that state where there is no, you know, you can be in form or you cannot be in form. And yet there are deities who do keep their form for the benefit of the, of the cosmic show. <laughs> and yet the consciousness is still in that. So it's hard to, it's hard to describe it in pictures, what beautiful flowers and, you know, heavenly uh, colors and skies. I mean, it's, it's whatever, however beauty, whatever beauty you can manifest, that's how it manifests. <laughs> Wonderful, madam. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think Suresh Babugaru has um, a question or a feedback to share with you. Suresh Babugaru, would you like to yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, please go ahead. You know, thank you very much, ma'am, for uh, giving such an enlightening message. Today is a great day in our Pyramid Spiritual Society's movement. Uh, one thing I would like to ask her, uh, uh, when we ask Mahadev, he will bless us only with the one gift. But uh, today, your enlightened message gave not only aspects of untold story of Sita, but also glimpses of Rukmini. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, in the interest of our viewers, I would like to uh, put small two questions uh, which you can enlighten us on these two things. One is, uh, what is the impact of Janak Baba on today's local self-governance? That's one thing. 
and uh, second thing is what is the impact of children bringing in nature as uh, mata sita brought lopez in nature these are the two things uh, kindly uh, let us thank you well i think that the um, as I, as i started to say janak baba this idea of self governance uh, um, of taking care of our own natural environment things have been so centralized that we have no control anymore over our rivers uh, a community can't keep its rivers clean because you know miles down 100 miles down there's a factory pouring toxins into the river um, we have to have a relocalization which is the tradition of of india and that was very much the thinking of of janak baba when you look to how are we going to progress as a human community how are we going to get out of this jam that we're in where things are are just being degraded without people even having a say in in it um we have to take better control at the local level of cleaning up our rivers of regrowing our forests protecting our forests preserving our food sources bringing back indigenous seeds um uh one of the things i was talking to this uh center for indigenous sustainability about is where are the seed banks are the seed banks cuz you know there was a there was a, a conscious strategy of the british to eradicate a lot of the indigenous seeds and to m- create monocultures so where in and that's that's harming human health i mean in the past during cetus time human health was preserved through the vast diversity of foods that were available um and 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 we've lost so much of that now they say you have to eat i don't know how many apples like 40 apples to get the benefits of what one apple used to have so our food has been so degraded like everything else um and so the message that i feel janak baba would give if he were here was be would be taking back a local control allowing allowing us to govern our local areas to um to preserve our environment and care for the needs of everybody you can't when you've got so many people how, how can you know what the needs are but at a local level you can care for the needs of of each community so that nobody has too little and so again balancing so don't take too much so that the, they have too little there ha- everybody has to have enough to live a good life but for sita um again i mean the extraordinary effort she went to 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 invite to 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 um inculcate this love and care for the natural world um and many of us have it we have it i think it's naturally within us but we don't know how to demonstrate it where the, the nature of modern life has so removed us um well the first thing is with food i i know all of you are vegetarian as i'm vegetarian the first thing is and then if you see how animals are treated for the meat industry they're not treated like living beings and so bringing consciousness to this and then when i first became a vegetarian um uh, 40 years ago people looked at me like i had an illness now it's very common place so it, there has been change but but we have to keep uh, uh hammering home these messages of caring for animals um and caring for our forests and caring for the rivers and it's best done we have to work at the policy level of the central government but honestly it's best done at the local level and and, and i was talking to this um uh indiga academy is is how local can it be can it be within the state level they said it has to be more local than that because i mean we we all know there's a lot of corruption in every level of political life everywhere and so you can have greater control when you can do it at a local level And so I think that's the message is that it's still coming. I mean I see Sita very active in the world today. So many people now are coming forth and talking about Sita. And so I see the presence uh, because there is a need evolutionary need right now. And so these presences are putting ideas into our mind and that's why meditation is so important. It makes us receptive to these ideas. I mean I say to myself what what do I know? You know, what do I know? I can make myself receptive and pray that that these ideas flow through me so that i know what to do thank you thank you i think madam your book had come at such a right time um where we really needed to reconnect back to mother earth and 
everything that your book said and the love that Sita Mata gave to Mother Earth has kind of reinvoked our connection back to Mother Earth. I see so many people, you know, writing back to me just because I've been wisdom sharing this book, saying, Madam, now we are planting, you know, this tree in our garden, that tree in our garden. It gives me such immense happiness, Vena um, Madam, that all of a sudden we have kind of gone back to our roots and we are trying to remember who we were and what was our connection with Mother Earth. I mean, every day is a festival, ma'am. We're really celebrating so much through this reconnection. That makes me happy because I think that's what's happening with us too here is that there's much more um, love. I mean, I say to people, every environmental talk I give, you have to fall in love with Earth again. It's not about doing your duty to care for it. You have to fall in love with Earth. You have to love the trees. You have to love the rivers. That's what, that's what Maja did. She loved the rivers. They were her daughters. She talked to them like they were her daughters. Well, in truth, they were. Yes. <laughs> Everything was yes. emerged from this from this divine feminine energy. That's true. Um, Madam, we have one more question from Swapna. Swapna, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, please ask your question? Yes, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, this is Swapna. Uh, I'm in very, very happy to attend this wisdom session too. Uh, I just wanted to share that since childhood, though I was connected with nature, but the way I got connected after reading Untold Story of Sita is I, could, I can say it's a new level. Like whenever I go out, whenever I sit in my garden, the way I connect now is like totally different. And thank you so much for bringing this book to us. And it was a great uh, read and great wisdom. And honestly, the way I could connect to Sita Ma, as you said, like every time it was like Rama, Sita and family, but it was, we saw a friend in Sita, like after seeing this, after, after reading this book. And uh, I mean, really, I just wanted to share that. And today, the way you said how we can apply that consciousness to our everyday life and try to get our questions answered was like amazing, ma'am. And thank you so much for sharing your experience. And thank you so much for inspiring us. I just wanted to say that I, I did not have any questions. And I wanted to say one thing was I was so connected with Soma somehow when I was reading the book, uh, the way she was carrying herself, the way the, her confidence, her surrender and her trust uh, with Sita Ma. And she was always like, maintaining her calmness and she was so confident that Sita Ma will be fine and she'll take, she can take care of herself. Uh, that was like amazing, ma'am. Somehow I got so connected to Soma and I literally saw myself in that scene when, I mean, every scene was like that. Yes, that scene wherein when uh, Sita Ma goes into the forest for some time and everybody was worried and Soma goes, uh, you know, it, it was like amazing when, uh, I mean, amazing, ma'am. I have no words. I'm actually still, and I can feel so much energy today too. Thank you, ma'am. Beautiful. I, I actually often find myself talking to Soma. <laughs> <laughs> She's a very real presence in my life. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Someone got so connected with uh, Soma. Yeah. Madam, you're talking about Soma. So um, if, if you were Meenakshi and you had another life at, as Sujata in your book, uh, which, was, which is about Rukmini, was Soma there again with you at this point of time? Soma wasn't, but there was another beautiful soul, Anjali. Um, and there are beautiful stories about her. Um, what, you know, there are many stories in the book that relate back to Sita. Uh, because I talk, yeah, uh, um, in, my, in my story, I'm part of a, a, a dance community that was in Vidarbha, uh, uh, Rukmini's kingdom. Um, and I had been to Dwarka, and that's where these memories, I, I had long ago seen that I had a life in Dwarka, but I didn't know the details until I went to Dwarka. And, um, uh, and then when Rukmini marries Krishna and moves to Dwarka, a lot of the communities, because Rukmini was very much into beauty, into the arts, and she loved to go in disguise and watch the dances. She'd always disguise herself as a village woman and go watch the dance, the dances at the celebrations. And so the dance community shifted to Dwarka, as did some of the other artisans shifted to Dwarka. And there's a whole story about her work in Dwarka, um, which is to me very beautiful, very beautiful. Uh, and it, it's kept me connected to Sita because um, there's so many links and crossovers. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be have this book that I'm working on now. <laughs> 
So are we, madam? We can't, we can't just wait for this book to release, honestly. I think we have just reached the time, ma'am, and um, it would be very appropriate for us to let you go at this point of time. You have really given your valuable two hours um, for us, and I really can't um, thank you enough. So I really, on behalf of all the viewers and on behalf of the panel members and on behalf of PSSM, I would really like to thank you, Madam, today for really spending this great two hours of wisdom sharing. As Dena, Madam, you know, we, we can never get tired of you. We are always waiting for you to share more and more with you. And I'm sure that in time to come, we'll have greater opportunities to spend this great time with you. So my dear friends, on behalf of all of you, I'm thanking Dena, Madam, for giving her her very valuable time today and sharing such pearls of wisdom on this platform. So thank with you. that, Thank you, madam. With that, we'll close our session today. Thanks to all the viewers and the PSSM Global and Digital Swatya Yoga team. Thank you very much. Ma'am, Anuradha, madam, want to talk with madam. Madam, you're okay if we if if there's someone else to are you okay to extend it a little bit? Sure. Oh sure. Okay. Uh, Anuradha, madam, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Oh. Okay. Go ahead, madam. Ah, okay. Okay, madam. Okay, thank you, madam. Uh, madam, uh, Dene Maram, I would like to congratulate you for introducing new book, uh, Rukmini, in the month of March next year. And uh, the session was very excellent. Uh, madam, my question, my last little bit question, uh, please share your past lives from Anuradha. <laughs> That's not a small question. <laughs> oh, you can read all about them in um, uh, in my books. Um, That's um, right. In Journey Through Time, I go back um, yeah. seven or eight lives. And then in the uh, new book, White Moonshine, uh, White Moon Rises, I go back to the Vedic time. Uh, uh, so you're, so, you know, I'm happy to share, but it would take a long time. <laughs> five minutes, five minutes. Hmm? Anuradha, uh, I think the book that Madam referred, it's quite a great detail about yeah. all her past lives. Madam would be here, I think, for the next half an hour if she has to describe <laughs> that book. <laughs> I'll leave that to Madam. <laughs> But if you can't get, it should be on Amazon in India. If you can't get it, you can let me know and, and uh, uh, we can have it sent I, to you because there's a lot of detail. I have a copy of it, madam. I can pass it on to her. Okay. Okay. I have read that book and it's amazing. I'll send it to her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anuradha, you have any other questions apart from that past life questions? Oh, no, madam. I don't okay. have any questions, but the session was uh, excellent. And your anchoring is very nice. And uh, we are, we are uh, oh, congratulates you both from Swadaya team, Anuradha, Sai Teja, and Soinalata. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sai, are you happy for me to close this session or is yes, there any other yes, question that I can't see here? Yes, ma'am. I want to conclude with somewhat. Uh, madam, it's a blessing to have you here, madam, to share your wisdom. And uh, we are eagerly waiting for. Rukmini to come forward, madam. And, uh, <laughs> thank you so much, madam, for uh, coming here and sharing your wisdom uh, with us. It is a pleasant day, madam. Thank you so much, madam. It's a madam pleasure for my spiritual family. So I feel very close <laughs> to all of you. So I'm, I'm, it's always a pleasure to be here talking to you because we, I feel like our minds come together. You know, we're, we're, we're in the same consciousness. <laughs> so. yeah. Madam, can I take a you picture, have... madam? Huh? Madam, can I take a picture? Can I take a picture now? Of the that. screenshot you mean? The screenshot yes, size? It's, it's, it's a screenshot, ma'am. Madam, is it okay for you? Sure. Yeah, yes, okay, yes. go ahead. One second, madam, one second. Uh, Professor, once you also turn yeah. on your video, sir.
opportunity madam you are you are calling us your soul family we feel very very <laughs> happy so as you can see all the viewers you know you have made our day today so thank you very yeah. much once again so did you. you get that shot yes ma'am i have taken madam uh, really it's a pleasure to have you madam uh, to share the wisdom thank you so much and sir thank- madam thank you for your anchoring thank you uh, very nice madam thank you so much thank, thank you everybody much, thank you thank and you. see you soon i'm sure saroja ma'am <laughs> So, so I want to send my special compliments to you. Oh, thank you, thank you very Bye, much. Saroja, so my special you. gratitude to you. Thank you. <laughs> I, all, all my gratitude goes back to Dena, mm-hmm. Madam. Honestly, and I think there is some connection so between. Much, yeah. between yeah. dena madam and me i i really madam some day i will find out what's the connection between you and me when i can see that life where we both were together till then i'll hold that question with me <laughs> maybe when we meet maybe when we meet in person we'll find it definitely madam uh-huh. so it's with yeah. thank or you or maybe through 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 the dreams ma'am through the dreams we can found find the connection <laughs> because maybe all of our dreams. questions are answered in dreams only that's right that is true that's right. that's true and thank you very much dena yeah. dena ma'am and saroja ma'am everybody take care posting. and be well yeah. until take next care. time okay bye. Yeah. bye 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 hello